Mobius Zero is another question. Are any U.S. politicians anti-China? Are there any that exist? I mean, if people think war with China will never happen, I mean, what do you think, Brian? Have you have you observed any? I can't I can't think of any. And, you know, the thing that's constantly sh shocks me on a daily basis are people who pop up in my comment section. And then and then the, you have politicians who are exactly like this, too, where they're like, right. uh, Brian, you're absolutely right about Ukraine. Your analysis on on Ukraine, you, no one does a better job than you, but you're 100 percent wrong about Taiwan. And then they start listing li literally talking points right out of the U.S. State Department. And I I just wonder where that that comes from. And I really do think that it comes from this uh, Western uh, supremacy and also racism. And I know it is a huge factor. I'm an American. I, I grew up in America and I was surrounded by people who just, they've just looked at Chinese people and Asian people in general as uh, ca caricatures, cartoon characters, uh, living stereotypes. They, they did not respect them. They looked down on them. They, instead of looking at the differences and learning something from them, they, you know, looked down on them for them. And this goes from the, the ground level in America all the way up to the leadership. And the, the leadership is encouraging it. You know, you know how sensitive the U.S. is about certain issues regarding race and religion, uh, but it's it seems like it's open season for Asians, and it has been for years and years. Uh, yeah. it's, it just gets worse. Every, every time I check, it gets worse. Yeah, and I mean, war propaganda, to to wage wars, we were talking about this earlier with regard to the earthquake before we came on live. You have tens of thousands of people in Turkey, in Syria, dead from an earthquake, and you have the U.S. maintaining sanctions on Syria. And in order to do such profoundly cruel acts and policies and to, you know, torture people, to hurt people, to kill people en masse for your geopolitical interests, for your narrow interests, the only way you have to, I mean, you have to dehumanize. And you've talked about this, I know, with Carl and uh, Mark Sloboda on your programs about Chinese history. I mean, how could the U.S. enforce an open door? How could the U.S. try to uh, uh, subordinate China for the last, you know, several hundred years without some kind of ideology? Uh, the, uh, Europe was a huge participant, too, it participated in it, too, the Yellow Peril. So... All of this is real. I mean, you can't divorce it from the geopolitics because no matter where you look in the world, where the U.S. is waging war, where NATO is waging war, there is an ideology of dehumanization that backs it up. It's it's 100 percent necessary in their eyes. Th think about this. Uh, we you know, the stereotype that Asian people have no creativity and uh, all, all of the technology that China has, they just copied the West. And these are tropes that you see uh, all, all throughout racist anti-Asian circles all, all across the West. And then it manifests itself in Western foreign policy. And they, they accuse China of stealing intellectual property and, you know, oh, everything that they have, they stole from us because, uh, you know, yeah. only white people can come up with these ideas. Certainly not, uh, you know, the people who invented uh, paper and gunpowder and everything like that uh, when, when we were still living in the dirt. But Never mind that. And uh, this is this is how you can see the, the racist tropes that everyday people have floating around in their minds. And it goes all the way up to actual policy being uh, constructed and used on the global stage. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's 100 uh, well, percent. We were also talking right before the show about uh, I forget what the guy's name is. He's some maybe he's some policy. Yeah, let me let me bring guy. him up. I can bring up. I got the tweet up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what he is. He he worked on Mitt Romney's campaign. Uh, he's some he's some kind of Republican Party something or other. The we can call him a, just a China watcher here, but he's not really a China watcher. He just a China, China, hater. Yeah, China, a China hater. China hater. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So actually, let me um, before I pull it up, let me just make sure it's paused because it's one of these doying videos. All right. So here we go. We're going to pull up um, the video of his name. And is Aaron Jin is his name. Yeah. So he says. 
Don't visit China anytime soon. Going anywhere requires signing up for their social credit system. And here is the video in question. All right. And then we can get, I will just read a reply or two to thoroughly debunk this nonsense and then get your comments. Brian, here we go. Do you have your password? It sounds so that's all we need to watch for that. It's, it's, it's almost a minute long. Uh, but of course, the implication here is that this child <laughs> is basically enforcing the social credit system in China. And then there's some really interesting uh, replies. Here is one. So this went viral on Douyin, which is the uh, Chinese TikTok. And it says it went viral with over 500,000 likes because a kid in China is helping a pretty looking foreigner use WeChat at a supermarket. Nothing to do with social credit score. So that's that's the image of that. And of course, Arnaud von Trond, uh, he also had a little threat about it. But you did a video, Brian, on social credit. <laughs> And also, you've done a lot on this propaganda war on China. What are your thoughts about this? Because I feel like this goes right into what we were just talking about with dehumanizing China. I mean, this is a child. It's so obvious. You just watch the video. This child is just helping these people you figure can, something out. You can out. hear him say about WeChat Pay. And so yeah, what, what a lot of Westerners... Password, you know, he's like trying to help them. Yeah. Yeah, what a lot of Westerners who who have never traveled abroad don't understand is that there there is another you know there are countries outside of the West they have their own banks and they have their own social media platforms and their own financial services and payment services other than what the West offers and when you go to say a supermarket even here in Thailand Thailand has all kind has huge banks and they all have their their different payment systems. And you have, if you want to do something like a, a cashless payment, you have to be in their system. They don't care what you're using in America. It's, it's Thailand. They don't care. Just like a, America wouldn't care that you're from Thailand. You have some ties, you know, to an American obscure system from Thailand. They don't care. You got to use the system that's being used there in that country. And that's all that was going on in that video had nothing to do with social credit. And I've looked into social credit because I, I wanted to know why are people asking me about social credit. So I, I looked into it and I put a whole video together about it. And it was all based on Western media articles, not a single article from, from China or even a, a source that could con be conceived as pro-Chinese. These were all extremely anti-Chinese articles when you read through them. But when you read the entire article and, it, and, and uh, think about what they're actually saying, they're saying, no, it doesn't exist the way people think it, uh, it does. Uh, a lot of it is common sense things like if you're on a train and you're you're smoking in a train, they, they're going to put your name in the system. You're not going to be able to to go on the train again. It's, it's like, why would you want someone who's blatantly breaking safety and health uh, rules to be on the train? And you see this all all over the world and manifests itself in all different ways. China's just using technology because they've got 1.4 billion people. Uh, you can go to like a... a, a a convenience store in America, and they'll have pictures of people's faces that aren't don't, that can't be served there because they've uh, ri written bad checks or something like that. Used to be a thing, and they would put your face right there near near the cash register. Mm -hmm. That so that's all that is. But these people, they know it's not true, but they also know that Americans uh, don't know what's going on outside of out of the country, and they'll they'll believe these lies because they already have a pre you know their prejudice already. And it won't take much. They want to believe the lie. They want to believe that China's evil and backwards and gross and weird. They want to believe that. So they'll they'll buy into these stories no matter how flimsy they actually are and how little evidence exists to, to, to substantiate them. 
And I think forces like this, people like Aaron Jin, they have to make it really scary because one of the things I think even just in this video that is revealed is that you have people from the West very confused, do not know how to even use this kind of technology. When I was there, I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't. First of all, I didn't. You know, I think uh, it's probably the case that those who are being helped, those foreigners from the West, they might have a deeper relationship in China and just don't understand. I mean, WeChat Pay is quite complex. It's different. It's digital payments. And it is an advancement in technology, especially financial technology, which the alarm bells are already being sounded. You have people at Credit Suisse. You have huge Western uh, financiers talking about how concerning it is that there are these digitalized currencies coming about, these digitalized central bank currencies. You have de-dollarization, all of this. I, I think part of this is just a deliberate pet propaganda campaign to deflect from what actually is happening, which is it, it, China is surpassing the West and, and actually emerging economies will follow right along at, at some point in the future if uh, they are successful in charting this multipolar world. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of things that uh, China, who supposedly they can't come up with any ideas on their own, but they're actually leading the world in, in multiple fields, in, including financial technology. And you, you're exactly right, because if, if that was a, a video of some kid helping uh, a, a woman with her visa or MasterCard, this wouldn't be an issue because, hey, they're they're using our stuff. So that's great. Um, not move along, nothing to see here, but they have their own unique system. This is what allows someone like Aaron to prey on ignorant people because people don't know about these other systems. And then they just look at it. They don't know what it is. So he's saying it's social credit. So in their mind, they believe it's social credit. It surely couldn't be Chinese people coming up with their own system that is as good or better than what, what the West uses on a day-to-day -day basis. So we just have one more question and then we can close out. Um, Irish Partisan asks, do you see global conflict, World War III breaking out this decade? Will it be Russia, China versus the West? Your thoughts, Brian? It's an ominous question, but a good one. It's trending all the time on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we're we're in it right now. This is already World War Three. It's just a question of how far is it going to go. Uh, like I said, the U.S. is killing Chinese people right now all around the world using terrorists that they they arm and back to do it. They have opposition. Like I, I mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned uh, several examples in Pakistan. The U.S. for for many years now has been backing Balochistan separatism. And this is to disrupt the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And they have terrorists who just kill, literally kill Chinese engineers, blow up infrastructure. And they also made a, an attempt on the Chinese ambassador's life at a hotel. And this was all, I mean, this has spanned many years and it's, it's going on even this year, right now, 2023. And in Myanmar, the military there ousted the U.S. client regime that they installed into power, just like they installed the client regime into power in, in Georgia 2003, Ukraine 2014. The military ousted it, and then the U.S. Was, is backing this opposition. They're carrying out terrorism. Just if, if the U.S. can't have it, nobody will. So they're just trying to destroy Myanmar. But again, also, while they're doing all of this, they are deliberately attacking Chinese factories, uh, there's a Chinese pipeline that is part of the Belt and Road Initiative that runs through Myanmar that they have attacked. And uh, even here in Thailand, there's no, not f uh, for now, there's no major violent movement uh, in Thailand, but the U.S.-backed opposition here has openly come out and said they want to cancel the Thai Chinese high-speed rail. And they are completely backed up one side and down the other by the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy. So this is what the U.S. is doing in absolutely every single country. And then you have uh, people being killed. That is already a, a proxy war. Ukraine is a proxy war. Syria is a proxy war. The, the deadly violence unfolding all over Iran, that is a proxy war. When you really add it all up, it, it is World War III just because of the threat of direct conflict and the possibility of a nuclear exchange, they're doing it by proxy. So it's kind of a slow-mo version, slow motion version of a world war. And it's just a matter of how far it escalates.